This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with Masters of Horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's guest is Kevin Lucia. He is a great short story writer and novelist, and he is also the editor for Cemetery Dance paperbacks and ebooks. And Cemetery Dance is one of the best in the business in the horror genre. So it was fascinating to talk to the head honcho about all that is going on in terms of the paperbacks and the ebooks. Now, talking about talking to people. Bob Pastorella and I have just finished recording four days and 11 hours of conversation. We have had some three-hour marathons. We've been speaking to Michael Seidlinger, Paul Tremblay, Clay McLeod Chapman, and Tyler Jones. Four mornings that will turn into the afternoon because they went on so long. And wow. Exhausted, but also inspired, as I often am when I have these conversations. So you're going to be getting an influx of This Is Horror podcast at the end of this month, which is now. It's up on us. The influx is happening, my friend. But if you want to support the show, if you want to keep things going, keep the show alive, and goodness, I would really appreciate it if you did. I'm not in the best situation myself at the moment, but... I'm trying to create good art, as Neil Gaiman and Chuck Wendig would say. But if you can support us, do consider becoming a patron. Go over to patreon.com forward slash this is horror. You can submit questions to each and every interviewee. You can get every episode ahead of the crowd. You can become part of the Writers Forum on Discord. You can listen to all the exclusive podcasts, the Q&A sessions, Story Unboxed, On Camera, Off Record. And believe me, if you support this as horror, it's going to mean a lot to me. It's going to mean more than you probably know. So I would love it if you did. Go over to patreon.com forward slash this as horror. Check it out and see if it's a good fit for you. Okay, before we get into the conversation... A little bit of an advert break. The Demonic Brilliance Film Festival is a competitive horror film festival celebrating excellence in horror. Organized by horror filmmakers for horror filmmakers, it is now open for submissions. There are awards in all major categories and a submission fee is just $6.66. 100% of submission fees and ticket sales are donated to charities. Does your film have what it takes to be awarded Best Film at the Demonic Brilliance Film Festival? Check out all the details at filmfreeway.com slash Demonic Brilliance Film Festival. The deadline to submit is August 31st. Cosmovorus, the debut cosmic horror novel from R.C. Housen. Esmeralda has lived on the fringes of society for as long as she can remember, until a Halloween night gone wrong unlocks a cache of nightmarish memories. Visions of a bizarre desert town, images of a mysterious woman, the pain of an ultimate betrayal, and the shame of a bargain made in blood. Now she must travel back and learn the true nature of the ravenous cosmos. Cosmovorus, available everywhere books are sold. Okay, with that said, here it is. It is part two of the conversation with Kevin Lucia on This Is Horror. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your fiction and I thought a good place to begin is to talk about the Clifton Heights mythos. So talk us through the genesis of that. So <laughs> the genesis of that was a combination of things. Um, 
right about the time that I discovered Stephen King, I was getting a little tired with science fiction. You know, I'd, it didn't take many rejections and for me to have a kind of honest appraisal that my science fiction just sounded like bad, bad Star Wars fan fiction. Um, so in the, in the, you know, the, uh, um, what I found in, in Stephen King was really something that I, I felt like this is, I don't know, there's something there. So I started writing and I read, of course, tons of Stephen King uh, books. And, and I, I'll be honest, a lot of my early attempts at writing were uh, basically me rewriting it, rewriting needful things. You know, I mean, you read, read all these books and you don't realize you're copying them at the time. You kind of really are, you know. And I was trying to write this small town horror novel that was big and sprawling and, you know, a lot like Salem's Lot, you know. It, Salem's Lot, it, to me, is one of my favorite and maybe one of the all-time great small-town horror novels. Just the way King personifies the lot, you know, uh, and the way he does these broad, you know, uh, third-person omniscient looking at all the people. And I really had a hard time finishing stories at the very beginning. And, you know, I, I had three or four years there where I probably just um, – you know, prior to me selling the first story, I was just rewriting the first half of a novel over and over again. And what I found, um, as I finally decided, I kind of decided that, I'm like, well, we're going to just, we obviously can't get a novel done for some reason. Let's try to start learning how to write shorter stuff. So I started turning my attention to short fiction. And I realized that a lot of these little character sketches that were supposed to be part of this big composite novel they realized there was a lot there that could turn these people into, you know, short stories of their own. And then the idea occurred to me because of course, again, every young writer thinks they're brilliant and they're doing something no one has ever done before. Uh, I thought, wow, it'd be great if all my short stories happened in the same small town, <laughs> you know, cause nobody's ever done that before. Um, so that's what I kind of started doing was, uh, you know, when I started trying to submit my stories, I wasn't really thinking consciously about it. I just was sort of thinking, oh, it'd be kind of cool if, uh, you know, someday a, a collection could be put together or whatever. I, like, I didn't think that anybody would ever notice these short stories would take place in the same place. But I had so many of these collected bits and pieces of characters, and I think that's what was intrigued me was I was trying to write this big composite novel. But then I started thinking of the town and thinking about how everybody's got a story, you know, and what if you have this town where everyone's stories are awful? Or, you know, but of course, as as I, time went on and I matured as a writer, it wasn't that everyone's story was awful, but I realized that there are people that live on the fringes, you know, the marginalized, the things like that. You know, in a small town like this, they'd be easy prey for something supernatural. And of course, along the way, as I'm selling these stories, and I, I started like one summer, I, as much as I love Stephen King, like because I had the uh, the the Holy Trinity of horror there for the for a while, Stephen King, Peter Straub, and Dean Koontz. That was all I was reading. And as fine as those authors are, I, I one summer I was like, I really got to start like, you know, I've heard people saying all these names like Charles Grant and T.M. Wright and some newer guys like Gary Braunbeck. I really need to start reading all of these books. Um, and then when I discovered Charlie Grant's Ox Run Station, which was an absolute revelation, and I was, I, it was so, it was such an amazing discovery. I wasn't even bummed that, no, I, somebody had thought about this before. I was like, this is awesome. I want to do something like this. And of course, Gary Braunbeck has a Cedar Hill cycle you know, Stephen King has his Castle Rock stories. And um, and then what I started doing was going back and reading a lot of uh, Ray Bradbury's short stories. You know, he uh, wrote all of his story, all the stories there to take place in Greentown, Illinois. It's you know, supposed to be a stand-in for his hometown of Waukegan, Illinois. And someone mentioned, oh, you got to read Winesburg, Ohio. And I'm like, oh, Winesburg, Ohio, you know, by Sherwood Anderson. So in this formative period, I'm searching out all these other authors are doing the same thing. And rather than, you know, bumming me out because I hadn't come up with this original idea, I was like, well, this is, this is great. Uh, this is some, this is what I want to do. And, uh, 
to me, that, that that concept of, you know, every single person has a story, that gas station attendant has a story, uh, that lifeguard, that bored lifeguard at the beach who just looks like a bored college student, that person has a story. Uh, the burned out elementary school teacher, this or that, they all have a story. You know, I'm because I'm a horror writer. You know, of course, those stories end up straying into the supernatural and often dark places. Um it didn't get stitched together until about 2000, let's see, 13, when I sold uh, my most the, the most recent story at that time to uh, this new fledgling publisher uh, that was putting out an anthology called For the Night is Dark, uh, and the publisher was uh, Crystal Lake, uh, run by Joe Meinhart. And I sold a story to him and in that collection, and then um, I asked about another collection that he was putting together, and he said, well, we're looking to put together different authors for this collection. So, you know, we, we are had you in the first one. He said, but let me ask you this. I really want to publish a collection um, of yours. I'm like, do you have a collection? And I thought to myself, well, this is my chance. You know, this is my chance to write my Dandelion Wine, my Martian Chronicles, my linked narrative and I said, I do, I do have a collection I, I've been thinking of writing. I told him, I said, but I want to try something different with it. I don't want to just be like, here's my 10 short stories. And I explained to him what I want to do. He said, that sounds great. You know, so I, I developed the linking narrative uh, and kind of an overarching thing. And that, that's, you know, things slip through. Um, that was my first uh, collected uh, work of short stories. Um, it's also kind of like it's got a meta narrative. Uh, which is also permanently free on on Kindle, uh, by the way. So in, in the U.S. anyway, um, and that's what started it off, you know. And I just, uh, it's it's I don't know, you know, it's been great fun. Someone once asked me if I got tired of writing in that same universe, or I felt that was hampering or limiting. And I just thought, well, I thought, like, when you think of all the different people who live in a town like that, to me, the possibilities are endless, you know. Uh, and that's it's been great fun. To write, you know, um, in in and in, in. so I've now I've got you know several books and short story collections and novellas that are you know centered in my mythical little town. And it's in the Adirondacks because I love the Adirondacks. My we went up camping there every summer as a kid uh, for the first five years of our marriage. Before we had kids, my wife would go on a vacation there, you know, and we went on vacation there several years after we had kids. And there's just something up there in the Adirondacks, you know, it's just like very easily, you know, it's so densely wooded up there. And I, I, I'm probably being waxing poetic here, but the, the air feels heavier up there. So it's very easy to imagine, you know, a haunted town in the Adirondacks. So that's how, how that's how it came about. In terms of having the internet interconnected short stories and, the wraparound, I mean, that's kind of now become your trademark with your short story collections, because of course that happened in Through a Mirror Darkly and also October Nights. Yeah. Yeah. And Through a Mirror Darkly was kind of me, uh, that was a novella quartet. And I was kind of trying to, uh, probably did a poor job of it, but I was really trying to pay a, pay an homage to uh uh, Charlie Grant's Ox Run Station, you know, his novella quartets, you know, um, those were just, just amazing. You know, the orchard, uh, I think, uh, the black carousel, um, uh, what's the other one? Oh, uh, I can't remember the other two. Uh, I've got them over my shelf over there, but yeah, that those collected novella quart uh, quartets and, uh, um, that was, and then, and then, the uh, Halloween one, you know, I've always wanted to write a Halloween book. And I just decided last year I talked to Joe and said, I've got some stuff I can put together. And I said, I've always wanted to do a Halloween book. And he said, yeah, let's do it. And that was, that would, that in some ways is probably the most satisfying book that I've, uh, that I've ever written to date because there was so much of, of me scattered throughout that whole book. Yeah. And I think. Yeah, you and Joe and the stuff you're doing with Crystal Lake have become almost so intertwined that it's actually quite difficult to think of Crystal Lake and to not think of you and your work now. That's certainly <laughs> how I feel anyway. Well, you know, I, I, I've been with him since the beginning. And honestly, as far as all my Clifton Heights books, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much, I mean, I, I'll, I've, I've written two Clifton Heights novellas, for Cemetery Dance, 
I'm currently in the editing stage of a, of, of a Clifton Heights novella uh, for uh, Leading Edge Books. Uh, but when it comes to the bigger books, the Clifton Heights books, I'm probably always going to go back to uh, to a uh, Joe. You know, I've been there with him from the beginning. You know, I saw what he was doing there. I saw some of the early authors he was signing, and I was like, I think this this is this is going to be something. You know, and he, I've watched what he's built very carefully, very painstakingly. You know, he hasn't overreached like a lot of small presses end up overreaching at some point. And the thing about the, Joe that I always come back to is I know that every single release of mine through Crystal Lake, he's going to put his full, full effort behind. Like he puts his shoulder behind every, every book. He's always willing to try new stuff. He's like, how about we try this to market it this time? Or what do you think about this? And I'm always like, yeah, go for it. Definitely try it. You know, and I think, I think Crystal Lake is is very easily become. I mean, this obviously is self serving because most of my books are published through Crystal Lake. When it comes to the small press out there, I think it's got to be one of the premier small presses at this point. You know, you know, it's they've uh, they're all about the business. They're all about you know horror. They're all about establishing relationships with not only writers and readers. You know, and Joe is just a, a solid guy who loves the genre, but he wants to do right by both his readers and his writers. You know, and that that's a winning combination right there. Yeah, yeah, I second all of that. And mm -hmm. I mean, he's he's just such a good guy as well, and he's doing it for all the right reasons. And yeah, everything you've been saying, I've been nodding my head along to it. And I mean, I've been in pretty close correspondence with him since really the start of Crystal Lake and there's certainly a reason as well why multiple years our readers have voted for Crystal Lake as publisher of the year because they're yeah. mm -hmm. consistently putting out damn good work. Mm -hmm. Reading your work I, I love how you take something that is you know kind of uh, you know every day and it's just everyday life and as each paragraph you get, there's something more dreadful that's happening. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and I awesome. and I and I love that. And it, it's it's a it's a creepiness. And I'm really trying to to tap into that the my with my current work in progress now. Right. And that's when I thought, you know, you know, Charles Charles Grant. I'm just not well read in 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 Charles Grant. I've read you know, of his work. And I loved his anthology series. Yeah. Uh, oh, Shadows. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And Shadows yeah. was was a guaranteed library checkout for me. Yep. I've read every one of them. Yeah. Yep. But I mean, I guess with, with Grant, where's where's like the, the best starting point? OK, so um and I've got a great story for later about going, you know, having that moment where you're like, oh, my gosh, I have to go read these all, all these authors. It's a really, really great uh, story. But uh, um, when we're talking about the Oxford Station series, his first his first couple novels, The Hour of the Ox Run Dead, The Sound of Midnight, The Last Call of Morning, those are all very good, solid novels. You know, they have that kind of creeping dread. My favorite of that would be um, The Grave. Uh, the, and the nice thing about his Ox Run Station novels, which I've tried to mimic with Clifton Heights, is you really don't have to have a lot of um, pre-knowledge coming into them like if you read enough of them um then they start to build on each other and you know little bits and pieces of town lore but you could just mm -hmm. pick up you know i i initially i think read all of them out of order and it didn't really make much of a difference but the the grave is a really great um story um a novel i'm looking for his they've got some things lift oh they, they have them listen to the short stories that's why his um uh, horror novels short fiction yeah these are listening to short fiction i don't know why he's got four um novella collections um one is called the orchard 
The other one is called Black Carousel. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I've read from that one. Let's see. Because I remember, I remember having that book. But you know, the grape, and that that kind of that kind of leads me in to you know because he had this 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 place, this Oxford Station. You have Clifton Heights, right? And and like like you were saying, you build up the lore. So like with Clifton Heights, I'm trying to do the same thing with 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 my own work, and I, I think I think a lot of people are. You right. know, um, I have Grigsby, Texas. And one of the things that I love about Grigsby, Texas, and you may feel this too, is there's it's not really set in etched right. in stone. It shifts. And I yep. think that that so you 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 feel the same way. It's like I'm not going to etch this thing in stone. I no, it's as boy. far as the town lore. That and you know, in locations and things like that. I mean, yeah, there are. I are places that you know that that you cover multiple stories that yes. they're all in the same location but i yep. think like when you get into the outer edges of it it kind of i don't know i guess loses shape and yes. maybe that's a good thing i mean do you feel the and, same way yeah and that becomes part of the horror of the town you know that there's the, and then like i've there are several landmarks throughout the town that all that you know readers are going to be familiar with but at that at this point i consider all the books to be you know, um, you know, you you come in at any point, and maybe this book is going to be about a character who died as a secondary character three books ago, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it's his story now. You know, and I don't really, I don't really worry too much. Like I keep the geographical locations vaguely specific. Does that make any sense? It does. <laughs> just just specific enough. I'm not going to concern myself with. Well, how big is the town actually? You know, how many streets are actually in this town? Mm -hmm. Maybe that changes every day. We're not quite we're not quite sure how many streets are actually in this town. Nobody's quite sure. You know, um, and I just kind of leave it that way on purpose. You know, uh, like I said, there early on, I think I was trying harder to keep things. You know, I remember when I was writing Devourer of Souls, I think I referenced a character as being alive who when things slipped through I had them dead um but other than that for the most part yeah vaguely specific if that makes any sense like the novella I'm writing now one of the secondary characters is the main character in the Dark Tides collection coming out from Crystal Lake um mm -hmm. and even though this book from Bleeding Edge will come out after the book from Crystal Lake I don't necessarily need to you know these are not necessarily chronologically all lined up, you know, so there are times where I will, uh, um, eschew dates entirely. You know, I have one novella collection that's sitting with Crystal Lake right now. Uh, it can't be published yet because they're all very super limited editions that I wrote for cemetery dance. And as soon as they're published by cemetery dance, the rights will revert back to me and then Crystal Lake can publish them. But I specifically wrote those with a very little date references at all so that, you know, we're not pinning, pinning myself in a certain time period. Mm -hmm. Vaguely specific. I, guess. I love that yeah. term. That's 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 that, that kind of encapsulates everything. I think that a lot of small town horror falls into that category where everything is vaguely, you know, specific, you know, and occasionally you want that story that's going to have like a map you know right especially if things are kind of confusing but even i found with peter straub's work that he he describes things but there's no real i don't think i don't think he has a map in any of his books i don't know i can't i, I, don't, I don't know um but it, and I, don't, I don't think it's necessary you know so the funny thing about the map um i have a a young a uh, coming of age novel um, if I were to commit extreme hubris, I would describe it as my boy's life, um, set in Clifton Heights, set in the early 90s. Um, and I've outlined it. You know, the very first time I've ever outlined anything. I outlined it from beginning to end. And I haven't started writing it yet because I sense this is going to be a commitment. This is a big, sprawling book. It's going to be a commitment. But I also realized because of the nature of this novel 
because I have certain plot elements that need to make sense over the course of the novel that I did actually have to draw a map of what I thought Clifton Heights would look like, at least for this novel. Just because I had, you know, it's a, it's a novel, like, like Boy's Life. Boy's Life roughly spans a year and a half of Corey Mackinson's life. So if I'm going to write something similar, and I'm, you know, and we're tagging along with our 14-year-old protagonist, I'm like, I'm going to have to map out this town, especially because I had certain things that had to happen in certain, you know, the climax of the story. And I had to think, well, how long is it going to take him for him to get there? So, so that was actually the only time and I have not yet written that novel. I will write it. Um, you know, my, 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 my tentative title for it is uh, when we were young. Um, uh, it's, uh, that's a time commitment. That one is though, but that's the only time I found myself having a map map cliffs and heights because the nature of this, this sprawling novel where I'm like, I really need to know how far away the graveyard is from the main character's house. Cause how long is this bike ride actually going to take? Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. And a good thing about having, you know, creative control over Clifton <laughs> Heights is that you can like literally do the map for this one, but you don't need it for the others. Right. Yeah. You know, it and it's it's like a different version story. of it. Yep. Just need it for that story. Yeah. Um, uh, so I wanted to recommend some authors because you were talking about authors that build dread. Like uh, Charles Grant is definitely the uh, one of them. The other um, one, um, uh, Nightmare Seasons and Dialing the Wind. Those were his other novella collections. So it's uh, it's Nightmare Seasons, Dialing the Wind, The Orchard, and The Black Carousel. Those are his novella collections. I like his novels. His novels are good, but his novella collections are are where he really shines. Mm -hmm. Another author um, that bears investigating is T.M. Wright. Um, I was at Nikon 30 and just kind of poking around in the used, uh, you know, one of the vendors was selling used books and there was this novel called The Place. Um, At that point, I was really trying to figure out what type of horror writer I wanted to be. You know, uh, Brian Keene, Ray Garten. You know, uh, John Skip. These were novels that I all really enjoyed, but I just didn't see myself writing this stuff. Then I picked this novel up called *The Place* by T.M. Wright, and I was just astounded. It was this novel again. It was um, his, and it led me into discovering his work. Or again, very ordinary things just take on this this malice and this menace. Um, and then the third one would be Ramsey Campbell. Mm-hmm. You know, Ramsey Campbell just. He he just makes these normal things that are just they, they go. This is a snowstorm. Why am I like scared to death of this snowstorm? Because Ramsey Campbell is is doing his job. That's why, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those, those three writers in particular, I would recommend. Yeah, I'm very very familiar with Ramsey because then he was one of the ones that <coughs> was in the you know Dance Macabre, and then my first Ramsey Campbell. Was uh, I, and actually, actually, I, I was probably a little bit too young to to read it at the time, but I read the Parasite, and uh, oh. man, it fucked yeah. me up bad. And uh, <laughs> there's some there's some shit in there that uh, you know, he's he, the thing with people like they say, well, quiet horror. What is that? It's like horror light, you know? It's like no, right. it's like really fucked up emotional shit <laughs> you know his, his gonna... collection alone with the horrors should be required reading oh it's, yeah it's, it's amazing stuff but yeah he um and so i got on this got on this big ramsey campbell kick but you know and it's and i see i see that i see that kind of that same mundaneness and I hate using that word because it sounds like it, I'm like it, it, derogatory, but it's not. It's like you take right. something that's normal every day that you see. It's mundane, and you turn it into something that's so creepy. And that's, right. you know, it's like it's something you have to you can't you try to study it, and you can't grab it. It's slippery, you know. Right. And it, you, I guess I guess the only thing you can do is and a lot of my 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 own work is like you know, kind of hard and punchy. And I'm trying to get more I guess loose with it. And I really, you know, so I'm thinking that if I read more quiet horror, then that's probably what I'm looking for to get right. this kind of dread, yep. um, you know, because I have a main character who is, you know, basically throughout his entire life, 
he has suffered from night terrors. He has suffered from pareidolia, uh, which is where he sees things that that aren't they're, they're mundane, but they're 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 terrifying to him. You know. You know another and, author I would. Re- oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You're fine. Another author I would recommend that it probably isn't brought up nearly as much. And Peter Straub loves uh, this author. Uh, there's an author named Robert Aikman. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah. And he uh, he didn't like to call his writing horror. He liked to call them strange stories. And mm-hmm. those ones were just so subtle where you're just like, this is really disturbing. And I'm not sure why this is disturbing, but this is extremely disturbing. That was that was a huge impact to his work was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he wrote uh, basically these stories that you, you try to the length of them. If you try to get them published now, you'd probably exceed the word length. Oh, absolutely. And so, yes. Yeah, you know, they were they're like novelettes. Yep, you know? they were. Yep. And it was like that he wrote stories back when stories were strong and big, you know. <laughs> and and it's like and now we need twenty five hundred words. It's like really? I'm doing like eight, ten. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's my typical short story, like eight thousand <laughs> words now. Yep. But uh yeah, I'm familiar with, with with his not as familiar as I I've only read one volume of his work. So I definitely need to get more familiar with that. But that's, yeah, that's that's when I need to 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 look at while I'm trying to work on, on this story, as I'm one of those people I like to to read while I'm writing. <laughs> and some people don't, but I do. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, I understand that this Halloween you've got a new book coming from Thunderstorm. So the horror at Pleasant Brook is uh, my first novel, full-length novel. It is also my first work set outside of Clifton Heights, um, but set in an even smaller town in the Adirondacks, because I love the Adirondacks. And it is, um, I would like, I would hope that it is, is quiet, it would quiet, Quiet slasher or quiet splatter punk. Is that a genre? Um, I, I'm sure it has all the same sensibilities that I used to, but what I that I that I did on my usual writing, but my real my real feeling was, you know, I wanna write something that's reminiscent of those 80s small, you know, small town schlocky slo- small town horror no- uh, movies um, or novels. I wanted it to be, you know, modern though. I wanted it to be my story. Um, but it was one of those novels where I, I one of those projects where I kind of, my challenge was um, what new and interesting ways am I going to kill somebody in this chapter? That That's what became my, my guiding. And obviously I, I'm probably selling myself short. I mean, there's still a lot of my normal stuff in there. I mean, when, when I start creating characters, whether it's a quiet horror story or it's something a little bit louder, like this novel. Um, uh, I'm obviously going to be looking for character development and really digging deep into them and their backstories and things like that. But this one, I just wanted to be like, you know, I, I kind of want to let it rip, you know, in a horror novel, you know, and and that's that's the horror at Pleasant Brook. And uh, you know, I was talking. We were. I I had initially offered um, October Nights to Paul Thunderstorm um, last year. But he caught COVID uh, around that time. That slowed things down, and we re- realized we weren't going to be able to get out in time. And he was willing to do a limited edition of October Nights this year. But I was like, no, I mean, it's already been out. You know, let me give you something brand new or uh, even better. I said, I'm, I'm probably going to be done my first novel. Let me give you my first novel. Uh, so that's, it's, it's going to be limited edition, um, signed limited edition. Um, the print run is going to be kind of decided by the pre-orders. But if you've ever seen a Thunderstorm book, uh, man, those things are works of art. So uh, I'm really excited for people to read it. I'm really excited to hold it in my hands, and really happy to kind of. It's kind of a milestone. To, you know, now you know I've had a couple books of Cemetery Dance, and now I've got a book with Thunderstorm. So that's pretty cool. Oh yeah, and I mean all of these publishers, they're run by people who are passionate about books, who are passionate yep. about art and you know they're they're not gonna skimp they're not gonna cut corners they do this the right way so i mean what what a lineup to have things with crystal lake cemetery dance and thunderstorm (laughs) i mean you can't get much better no yeah i feel very fortunate yes and i mean in terms of releasing a book at halloween is this now a tradition for you and i mean what do you see 
as both the advantages and disadvantages of that because obviously you know it almost goes hand in hand to release a horror book at Halloween but because it does it obviously means that so many other horror authors do it too. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's going to become a new tradition necessarily. Although it kind of, it like, I'm also the, 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 the dark ties that I'm in. Uh, so I got you guys, I'm sure aware of Crystal Lake's uh, dark tide series where three mm. authors write novellas around a, a common topic. Um, mine is going to be in October and it's going to be Halloween. Um, and it's a Halloween story and even better, the other two authors who have joined me, I invited them to write their own Clifton Heights stories. Ooh. So that, that'll be, that'll be interesting to see how that works out. And of course, more than likely the horror at Pleasant, uh, Brook the following year will be out in paperback around the same time. I don't think I, 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 I want to do that every year. Um, you know, because I don't know if I can keep up that same kind of pace, um, but I've always wanted to, you know, and like I said, the drawback, not, not necessarily whatever the horror writer's doing it, but like uh, October Nights did awesome. It did really well, but it's uh, an October novel, a Halloween novel. So there's been a scattering of reviews since then, but uh, it was mostly all the reviews were in September, October and November because, of course, it was halloween season so and we'll probably put it on a kindle sale again this year so i don't that's another reason why i don't think i'd want to always do a book on halloween because you, you know um but just, that's just kind of how it's worked out because i've always wanted to like i've always the timing was just never right i've always wanted i love halloween it's my favorite time of year um you know and i always uh, wanted to write a halloween novel or halloween book and that's worked out the last couple of years but i i don't know if it's gonna be something i'm gonna intentionally do from now on yeah, and speaking of those reviews coming in in September and October, I mean, that, that's a thing that I guess as writers and publishers we have to consider. I mean, initially when we put a book out, we can get a lot of buzz if we do our job right as marketers. But how do you keep people engaged with your titles, again, both as a writer and a publisher, when it's been out for let's say six months or eight months or nine months what are you doing to you know ensure that you're still selling those books and you're still piquing people's interest um part of it obviously a certain amount of that is, is out of my control um you know uh obviously as a writer um i and I know they always, I, they, they always say this online, never re re read your reviews. And then I'm always like, well, this is the fifth time I checked Goodreads today. Uh, so I, first yeah. of all, I'm, I, I, I probably shouldn't, but I'm always checking all my books to see if there's a new review. So I'm never shy about sharing a review, you know, so I'm always kind of keeping an eye on my books to see, oh, look, there's a new, like, there's a new review of Mystery Road this morning. I'm going to share that. Oh, there's a new review of The Night Road. So I'll share that. I'll never be, you know, um, Joe is great as far as uh, consistently running uh, Kindle countdown deals on all of his backlist. You know, so he's, uh, you know, he's always trying to get it out in front of new readers and purchasing new ads and you know, tinkering with things. And he's always kind of tinkering with the Amazon categories to try to keep them in, you know, under fresh eyes and things like that. So as a publisher, I don't, I'm not privy to all the things he does there, but I do know that throughout the year, he'll let me know, okay, we're going to put these three of your books on a countdown sale and he'll let me know and things like that. So uh, now, uh, like I said, as a writer, I'm just always kind of keeping my eye, you know, on, or if I haven't had any um, reviews in a long time, I'll just be like, here's the unabashed, um, this is my latest work, here's what people have said about it, you know, I mean, I post lots of stuff on my Facebook and Twitter, so uh, the writing is only, and it says right in the bio that I'm a writer, so you would expect that I'd post about my writing, um, but, um, you know, I, 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 post anything relevant to the writing any new reviews any sales things like that um you know when they pop up in my memories i'll share the covers things like that um you know but um that's that's what i try to do as much as i can you know and but of course the inevitability of your oldest title 
kind of I mean, that's going to happen, you know, and that's why I think it's also why it's important for younger writers just to always keep writing. You know what I mean? You, you don't forget about the books that you had out there, but you should always be like, you know, yes, I got the uh, horror present, uh, the horror at uh, Pleasant Brook on pre-order. I've got the Dark Tides out in October, but I'm currently editing a new one right now. You know, when I'm done editing that one, I'm going to jump to, you know, I've got two other projects in the wings. So it's kind of a do whatever I can to keep my books in people's minds. But sometimes you can't always do that. So you just make sure you focus on the next project. So. It's pretty evident from talking to you that you have a lot of projects on the go right now. So you're not going to run out of any any time soon. That's for sure. Well, I've always told people, I said, my problem has never been not having enough ideas. It's It's been uh, which ideas are good and which aren't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many stories I've gotten about 45, 50 pages in a bike. This isn't going to go. <laughs> or at least this isn't going anywhere right now. You know, all writers are pack rats. I'll put that in the trunk. And, you know, perfect example of the, the novella um, that's going to be coming out in the Dark Tides in October. Um, that initially I started writing that. Uh, the summer before um, COVID mm. and then during COVID I tried to write it and I, I wasn't in a good headspace then. I don't think a lot of us were so I just put it in a trunk and didn't I really wasn't sure if I'd ever finish it and then I took it out and started tinkering with it for October nights because it was a Halloween story but I'm like eh it's not gonna fit and then a little while later Joe's like hey we're doing this novella thing do you have a novella and I'm like yes I do <laughs> Even though it wasn't finished. I always, I've learned that's another thing. If someone asks, do you have this? The answer is always, yes. That's yes, right. I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, you said that your coming of age novel is the first time that you've properly outlined something. I wonder what does your typical process look like going into writing a novel? I mean, how much the, are you pantsing and what kind of notes or ideas do you have? Because I'm, I'm pretty intrigued by you saying you'd only outlined once and then also saying there are some ideas where at 40 or 50 pages, it's like, yep, uh, the gas has run out. <laughs> so uh, it, 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 bears, it bears noticing that I've only outlined one novel um, and uh, I've, <laughs> I haven't written that many novels. Um, the, the horror at Pleasant Brook, um, I didn't have to outline that one because my my intention was that with that one was to I wanted to try to give the characters depth, but I didn't make the plot very uh, complex. Like I said, my, my my framework for that plot was cheap '80s small town creature feature, you know. So that was fairly easy to write because I didn't outline it. Um, I've got two other novels. Um, one that I'm going to start shopping around to an agent, one that needs extensive rewrites. Uh, that, in addition to the the pleasant uh, the the horror of Pleasant Brook, are the only novels I've ever written because I I I found a lot of success pantsing short stories and novellas. That seems to work for me. You know, I I zero in on an emotion or the character's needs and flaws and how is he going to resolve those things? He or she's going to resolve those things. And that usually works out. I've had so many novels though, where I've gotten, you know, to 600 pages and it just collapses under its own weight. In fact, one of the novels that's, that's waiting to be revised. Um, I finally just threw my hands in the air and I sent it to, um, uh, a good friend and, um, colleague and an amazing writer i sent it to ron Melfi. i said could you read through this for me and ron read through it and made some notes and he told me you've got a good 300 page novel somewhere as he's in these 600 pages i'm like yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so the the non non outlining novels has not really worked out too well so that's you know so for example the one novel that is i'm going to be trying to shop to an agent which is a weird western the weird Western involving Billy the Kid, that one I did extensively outline as well because I just knew there was no way to get through, you know, uh, the novel. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of how it's worked out for me. I don't have to outline my short stories and novellas, but I've learned the hard way that I am not a pantser when it comes right. to novels. 
That, yeah. That is that has generated a lot of words in a very unproductive manner. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about your work at Cemetery Dance, specifically in an editorial capacity. So how did that first come about? Well, I've been involved with Cemetery Dance behind the scenes uh, probably as far back as um, 2011. Um, I, um, back then, uh, I'd only had a handful of short stories um, published. Uh, I'd actually written a novella called um, Hiram Grange and the Chosen One. I wrote it that first, the now uh, gone Shroud Publishing. Um, he, they had a um, little mini series about this, you know, uh, monster fighter guy. Um, and what I, I was good friends with Norman Prentice and I brought Norman Prentice up to speak to my students uh, at the high school that I teach at. And Norman and I were talking and Norman's like, Hey, would you be interested in reading slush for cemetery dance? And I was like, absolutely. You know, because I learned in college, you know, reading slush is a great way to just, uh, you know, figure out the rhythm of what is someone trying too hard and what is a story. Like if, if, if you're caught up with all, you know, all the, if, if, if you're very aware they're quote unquote writing a story, may not, may not be that good of a story. If you're just like halfway through the story and you're like, you're blinking and you're like, wait, what, what happened? Then you're like, wow, that's a story. So, and, and, and I had that experience when I, uh, did slush reading in my at grad school so i said absolutely i would love the slush read for cemetery dance so i, I slush did some slush reading for the magazine and for their their first line of ebooks um and then uh a couple years after that they offered me the uh, uh review editor position because the person who handled the reviews editing position was moving on um and i was that i did that for several years uh i ended up stepping down from that just because my my writing was picking up and then at the beginning of this year, I still can't remember the, the how it came up with conversation, but Norman Prentice was currently just the editor of the eBooks. They didn't really have a paperback line. They were just sort of publishing paperbacks kind of occasionally. And Norman said, well, I wanted to let you know first that I'm, I'm, I got a full-time teaching job again, so I'm going to be moving on from this position at CD. And he said, it's a, it's a part-time, you know, part-time position, part-time pay. And he said, he said, I think you should throw your hat in the ring. And I said, even more, I think you should um, pitch uh, an entirely new ebook, paperback, small press arm of Cemetery Dance. Um, you know, and, uh, and do it through KDP and, and, uh, you know, Ingram, you know, so you can get on a regular publishing schedule. So I, I, I pitched it to Rich Chismar, uh, Chis was, to Mr. Chismar, you know, Rich was totally on board with it. Um, I think I almost just called him the Chiz. <laughs> it it <laughs> didn't sound like it, that. but I, I no, don't want, you, you know, what, he's why gonna, not? I mean, he's going to be, he's going to listen to this and be like, all right, that kid's getting too big for his well, when, when we, nope, when, when we get him back on the show, we'll have to be like, all right, how's it going, cheers? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know why that came out. So yeah. Rich thought that was a great idea. Rich thought that was a great idea. And so he brought me on, and we started to build a small press arm of Cemetery Dance. We're publishing um, paperbacks and ebooks. You know, um, and it's it's an awesome it's been an awesome development because I've always wanted to be involved in publishing as well as writing, like right along in college when I was trying to write, my friends and I uh, we put together we had grand plans for creating our own science fiction fantasy horror magazine, um, and we again we uh, put it together in Corel Word Perfect and uh, Ninja copied it and a copier at our school. Uh, and we probably had one issue and that was it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I sort of wanted to be involved on that end as well. But I saw a lot of writers early on who would tackle, especially in the early days of um, print on demand, because everybody sort of wanted to be a publisher or do, do anthologies in the early days. And I thought to myself, well, let's just focus on writing first. Let's let's establish a foundation there. You know, I, uh, you know, cause I love publishing, but I wouldn't ever, you know, I love what I'm doing with Cemetery Dance now, but I wouldn't ever want that to overwhelm my writing. So let's wait. And I just waited, you know, I waited for the right opportunity, you know, volunteered for a lot of places. You know, I, I worked as a contributing editor at Shroud Magazine when it was still around, 
you know, and this has turned out to be just a perfect opportunity because now I'm to the point where I've got a lot of done things that are done and in the hopper and waiting to be published my own work. And I have this set schedule where I get up every single morning and write. So I also am now doing publishing for Cemetery Dance. And it's it's really been a, a great experience. Um, you know, find, you know, having uh, reading work, uh, you know, by authors and then uh, creating their book together with the interior layout person and whatever uh, art, you know, cover artists we've uh, selected and, you know, finding ways to uh, try to promote that book was really I'm just trying to I'm kind of I'm not doing all the same things that Joe um, did obviously at Crystal Lake, but I'm trying to adopt the same philosophy that, uh, you know, every release that we're going to, we're, we're going to have, I, you know, I'm going to try to put everything I can behind it, you know, and, you know, it's been great, you know, and I've, I've got a great lineup of books to come, you know, I'm, uh, almost finished, uh, with my final reads of our first submissions period. I'm probably going to have books, uh, booked out into 2024, you know, at this point, um, and it's been it's been a really great experience. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, and I know when you were looking for things, one thing you said is if you have a novella or novel which doesn't seem to be horror enough by other standards, then send it in. So I've got to believe, kind of like this is horror and what we do with a podcast, that you're really expanding that definition of horror. Yeah, I, I got a great, like, for example, I accepted a great on um, a weird novella uh, by Nicole Cushing uh, mm. called The Plastic Priest, which, you know, may not necessarily sit, fit the classic definitions of horror, you know, but it was certainly, certainly unsettling and a, a very kind of a unsettling look at, uh, you know, belief and uh, non-belief and, and, and things like that in existence, you know, and I'm looking, I'm looking for it all, you know, I, we, uh, next October, we're going to be releasing uh, that night in the woods um, by Christopher Triana. Great, great Halloween horror slasher film or novel. Great. You know, so I kind of want to, you know, I kind of want to find it all. You know, I, when I finally came out of the horror scene, you know, I discovered leisure fiction a little late, um, but I, I was able to enjoy their novels before they fell. And one thing that always impressed me about leisure is that leisure had something for every horror fan. You know, they had the, the Brian Keene novels, the Gord Rollo or the, uh, you know, the John Evanson novels. But then they'd have the Tim Ledin or the Nate Kenyon novels or Gary Bronbeck. You know, they just seem to have something for everyone horror wise. And that's kind of what I would like to do at Cemetery Dance. You know, that's 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 what I, you know, uh, what I want to do is have that kind of like you're in the quiet horror. We got that. You're into creature feature, we got that. You're into slashers, we got that. Are you into existentialist surrealism, uh, dread? We've got that too. So, yeah. Now I wonder then, is there a type of horror or a type of aesthetic that you're not interested in or you're not concerned with, either as an editor or as a reader? And I, I suppose that those answers might differ, you know, what you're interested in as an editor or what you prefer as a reader might not necessarily be the same thing. I guess instead of picking a, instead of picking a specific genre, I guess what I would say is, um, when the genre trappings begin to, uh, when the genre trappings are far more important than the actual story and the characters, then I'm not interested in it. Uh, like, for example, um, I am not a fit fan of Splatterpunk by and large, but I love John Skip, um, the father of Splatterpunk. Mm -hmm. But that's because he was a great writer. You know, um, I just read The Scream on vacation this summer and it was. It's an amazing novel, and sure, it was brutal and uh, you know mm -hmm. pretty pretty graphic, but it was just so well written, you know. So um, I guess for me, it's like if if shock elements are I and mean, there's no substantive story there, then that's something I'm not interested in. You know, I'm not interested in something for shock value only. You know, I want there to be a story. You know, um, you know, and there's, that's debatable. Like I said, also too, you know, 
things hit editors at different times. You know, maybe this is, uh, I'll read a manuscript and it just wasn't ringing my bell, but maybe I'll read something similar to that like a year later and be like, no, nah, this, is, this is one, you know, that's, that's the weird thing about it. But uh, rather than saying there's a genre I'm not interested in, I would say that if there are, are shocking graphic elements to the story that simply are just outweighing any type of story or character development, that's that's not something I'm interested in. Mm, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, of course, with, with any subgenre, there can be great writing, even if you don't you know, necessarily vibe with the genre as a whole. So, I mean, with right. Splatterpunk, as you mentioned, John Skip, but also there's some masterful stuff from the likes of David Scow and Joe R. Lansdale or oh, another. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm wondering as well what the kind of slush reading, what the submission reading looks like, because we spoke to a multitude of editors and publishers before and you know for some people it can be that they read the first page and that you know they, they get an idea as to whether they're going to continue or not for some people i think maybe nick mamatas he'll read the first sentence and if that doesn't grab him <laughs> then he's out but there, there'll be others, you know, godlike figures who, f f or, or perhaps silly figures, who will read the whole damn thing. So what, what's it kind of look like for you in terms of tapping out and knowing, look, this, this one isn't for me? So uh, this summer, especially, because that's what I've spent was doing, is reading through the first batch, the first, you know, our open, open submissions. I did two reads. Mm -hmm. um, the first read was exactly that. I read a page got a sense for it. Um, if it didn't like, if I didn't put it this way, if there's ever a point where I'm just like, I don't feel like reading this anymore. <laughs> that should tell you something right there. Yeah. Um, then with the second round, that's when I spent a little bit more time on each one of them, you know? And, uh, again, I got a pretty quick sense two, three, four pages in, you know, there were a couple where maybe I came back to and gave it a second try. And then, you know, now I'm in my final reads, um, and, and I've accepted a lot of uh, several of the final reads. Uh, there's been, you know, there's more to go, and I anticipate maybe that'll happen with some of the final reads where I'll be like, eh, and you know, um, but yeah, for me, I, I'm really, uh, I've always been a reader first, you know. Uh, so I mean, if you misspell a word here or there that's not going to be a big deal or anything like that i'm not one of those type of people but really it's just like do i really want to keep reading this or am i like checking my watch as i'm trying to keep reading it then you know i, I it's pretty quick it's pretty quick yeah hard sell for me it's got to be like do i want to keep reading this sort of thing yeah yeah that makes sense and it sounds like you've got a pretty meticulous process then nailed down i like these different stages that you're going through that's great but i mean as, as you said like you get up and you write early every day you're also doing all these things for cemetery dance so i'm wondering what does a typical day look like for you how do you plan out your working day so, um, summers are pretty easy. Uh, summers, a lot of times I won't necessarily get up early. As, as you can imagine, we're up late tonight, so I won't be getting up early tomorrow because I'm a teacher. So I have the summers off. Um, so summers uh, are usually spent. I have found that as a writer, unless I'm chasing a deadline, um, I'm not much use afternoon. <laughs> I, I'm usually good up until noon and then as far as writing goes so what I will do is I'll spend an hour or two doing some writing in the morning you know um, and then end up breaking for lunch and then I'll focus on my cemetery dance duties uh, during the afternoon um, when we get back to school uh, that's when I'll go back to my early morning three in the morning uh, writing uh, and then I'll do my cemetery dance work uh, when I get home from school, you know, um, I'm, I'm fairly I able to tune out, you know, for writing, I need like silence, you know, I, I'm one of those like, 
you know, I need my absolute silence with my little scented, not a scented candle, but you know, I, that's why I get up at three in the morning. When it comes to other work, I'm, I'm pretty good at tuning other stuff out. Um, so, uh, the CD work done, will get done. Like we'll ca- I'll come home from school, we'll have dinner, do the dishes, and then I'll spend a couple hours out in the living room, you know, doing my CD work, you know, hanging out. I actually, my wife actually likes me doing CD work better than what I sometimes do when I come home from work and it's just plug my headphones in and kind of um, uh, doze out to Netflix. At least if I'm doing my CD work, I don't have my headphones in and she's like, you know, she's going to ask me a question and I'm all here. So, <laughs> yeah, but, but that's what I'll do. You know, I try not to do anything on Saturdays or Sundays again, unless I'm chasing a deadline or, or something like that, you know, Saturdays and Sundays, we just totally try to leave those off completely yeah and i found with cemetery dance uh because i do other things besides just manage the line you know uh i've taken on you know updating uh, products on the website and things like that i have found that for whatever reason that work seems to come in on mondays through wednesdays that doesn't seem to come in very much on thursday and friday so a lot of times thursday and friday after school uh, I'm not really doing a whole lot either. So, yeah, yeah. And in terms of the weekends, are you doing work then, or do you? No, take... I, I try to, if at all possible, I don't do anything on the weekends, writing or or publishing wise. Yeah. I mean, so... obviously, again, if a crucial e- if a crucial email comes, if emails come in from authors, I'm not going to ignore them. I'm kind of anal. I'm kind of obsessive about that. My email is always open. I'm one. Of, I'm I'm one of those people who emails and goes, "Why haven't you emailed me back yet?" So when people email me, I, I try to email them right back. Uh, so if authors contact me over the weekend, I'm certainly not going to ignore them. But I don't really try to do any publishing work over the weekend. Same thing with the writing. You know, I just try to take those completely off. Yeah, I am definitely not like that with email. So if I don't email people back quickly, it's nothing personal. So Oh, no. Yeah, it, my, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessive that way. So like, a, that's not a rational, like, that's just, a, why hasn't this person emailed me back yet? So, so I tend to make sure I answer everyone's emails as soon as I can. Yeah. Now, well, I'm, I'm sure people appreciate that. Well, I mean, we're, we're coming up to the time that we have together today, but it, this has been enormously fascinating. And thank you mm-hmm. again for being so generous in terms of just like, spending this time with us and telling yeah, us it's, about it's been great uh, you really I always enjoy just hanging out and talking about horror and stuff mm-hmm. yeah well i mean we'll have to do this again sometime it certainly sounds like you have no shortage of things coming out in the future so i mean yeah. may, maybe we'll get you on for for the epic kind of you know, coming of age, your boy's life one, whenever <laughs> that one's whenever ready. That gets done. Yeah. But I mean, where can our listeners connect with you? Well, so um, I have uh, two Facebook accounts and I have two Twitter accounts. My personal Facebook account is, um, let's see here. I'm trying to manipulate things. So my personal Facebook account is, is KB Lucia, Facebook backslash KB Lucia. You know, my personal Twitter um, is, I believe, Kevin B. Lucia. Yeah, it's Kevin B. Lucia on Twitter. Um, if you want to look to know more about Cemetery Dance uh, on Facebook, uh, it is CD ebook paperbacks. Uh, the same thing with the Twitter. Um uh, that is Cemetery Ebook on, on Twitter. Of course, Cemetery Dance is also on um, Instagram, and I, I basically uh, kind of run that as well. You know, and that's really where I am most of the time is is on those. You know, and, and the Kevin Lucia Twitter and Facebook it has my writing and all the general mundanity and insanity that is my life. Uh, for example, a lot of people have heard me complaining about toast crackers applesauce and rice all week this week because i've been battling a pretty stomach pretty nasty stomach virus all week i'm on the upswing now but uh so that's so that the personal account is my writing just my random foolishness the uh the cemetery dance 
uh, Facebook and Twitter is just all Cemetery Dance. Just our releases, reviews, uh, everything like that. All right. And do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Okay. So I, I have to share this story. I guess my final thought is you really, you know, you start out and you're, you're, you're a nobody and nobody knows who you are and it's a little intimidating and it's very, you know, the imposter syndrome is, it's a real thing. You're like, you're like, uh, I'm never going to be this. I'm never going to make it, you know, whatever. Um, but if you stay and you mingle and you get to know people and you go to conventions and you just stay in the game, some amazing things can happen. Uh, amazing things that you would just never, ever a dream of. And this actually happened to me uh, uh, back in 2011 and it's happened to me many times since. So I attended Borderlands Press Writing Boot Camp twice, uh, you know, run by uh, Paul Wilson and uh, F. Paul Wilson and Tom Monty alone. Um, through meeting them, I also brought them up to my school to work with my students. Um, they had mentioned that they had a friend in Binghamton that they were going to go see on the first night. And it didn't even occur to me that they have a friend in Binghamton, but I just, whatever. So I'm at home thinking, this is F. Paul Wilson and Tom Monty alone. You know, like Norman Prentice came to town and we went out and had dinner. But I'm thinking, I'm not going to take those guys out to dinner. They don't want to hang out with me. That's F. Paul Wilson, the guy who wrote Repairman Jack. And that's Tom Monty alone. And here I am sitting up, you know, just grading some papers. And then Paul Wilson calls me at home. And says, what are you doing? I said, nothing. Uh, I like to joke that my house could have been on fire and I still would have said nothing. <laughs> and he's like, uh, he's like, we're over at our friend's house. And you got to come over and see this. It's pretty awesome. And he gives me directions to his friend's house. Long story short, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, Whispers Magazine and the Whispers Anthologies um, of the late 70s and early 80s. Yes, um, I am. Paul and Tom's friend who lived in Binghamton was Stuart David Schiff. Oh, wow. The, the editor and owner of Whispers Magazine and uh, the anthologies. And I spent the evening with Paul Wilson, Tom Montelone, and Stuart David Schiff uh, eating uh, Chinese takeout and sipping scotch <laughs> and just sitting there and listening to them like unroll this whole oral history of horror, sci-fi, and fantasy. And it was the most gobsmacking moment. The reason why he called me over there is, on a side, on a side note, Stu is a, a fanatical con collector of things. And by things, I mean not only books. This is a man who, among other things, happens to have um, Steve McQueen's death certificate. I don't even know how you get Steve McQueen's death certificate, but he mm. has Steve McQueen's death certificate. So he has this unbelievable museum of the weird in his basement. That's why they invited me over. But here, here I am a nobody and I'm sitting here hanging out with Paul Wilson, Tom Angelo and Stu Schiff. And they're just, they were talking about being generous with their time. They were just treating me like an equal and just hanging out. And I've been over to Stu's several times since then. I have even been over to the Stu's by myself, hanging out with him and I mean, back in 2007, this would have been like, yeah, right. Like that's ever going to happen to me. Um, but that was probably one of the most uh, gobsmacking experiences of my career. And I, I guess if that's my final note to young writers, they just, you, you never know, you know, you start out thinking you're nobody and not that I think I'm somebody, but I never would have thought these people would ever give me a time of day. And to be so generously invited over like that, that was, that was absolutely amazing. Well, all right. What a conversation with Kevin Lucia. Very generous with his time and with his knowledge. So thank you so much to Kevin for joining us. But next episode, it is the first of a huge conversation with Clay McLeod Chapman. So that will be dropping in a few days. But if you want to listen to it right now, if you want to get this ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. 
Not only do you get early bird access to each and every episode, but you can submit questions to our wonderful, wonderful interviewees. You can get exclusive podcasts, Story Unboxed, a horror podcast on the craft of writing, where we analyze and dissect short stories and films. And, of course, the Q&A session, so you can submit any question to me and Bob, and we will answer them. There's also the Writers Forum over on Discord, so you can get help with your current work in progress. You're part of a community. We're all doing challenges. We're all working towards bettering ourselves. And on top of all that, it would mean so much to me if you support us. I'm going through some things at the moment. It would be invaluable. So if you think it sounds good, head on over patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Have a bit of a gander. Ooh, check it out. See if it's for you. And if it is, then join us. Okay, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. Cosmovorus, the debut cosmic horror novel from R.C. Housen. Esmeralda has lived on the fringes of society for as long as she can remember, until a Halloween night gone wrong unlocks a cache of nightmarish memories. Visions of a bizarre desert town, images of a mysterious woman, the pain of an ultimate betrayal, and the shame of a bargain made in blood. Now she must travel back and learn the true nature of the ravenous cosmos. Cosmovorus, available everywhere books are sold. The Demonic Brilliance Film Festival is a competitive horror film festival celebrating excellence in horror. Organized by horror filmmakers for horror filmmakers, it is now open for submissions. There are awards in all major categories and a submission fee is just $6.66. 100% of submission fees and ticket sales are donated to charities. Does your film have what it takes to be awarded Best Film at the Demonic Brilliance Film Festival? Check out all the details at filmfreeway.com slash demonicbrilliancefilmfestival. The deadline to submit is August 31st. All right, to wrap up, to end the episode, a little quote. And this is from Charles L. Grant. I thought it would be apropos, seeing as Kevin Lucia is such a big fan. If all the world's a stage and all the people players, who in bloody hell hired the director? I'll see you in the next episode with Clay McLeod Chapman. But until then, take care of yourselves. Be good to one another. Read horror. Keep on writing and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.